So, hello everyone. I'm Jesse Walsh, and I'm here to give the overview seminar on computational biomodeling and systems biology. So, of course, the first question is, what is systems biology? Um, to be honest, there isn't really a universally accepted definition. Even the uh, Institute for Systems Biology recognizes that its own scientists don't agree on a single definition. But they do give the definition of uh, the study of an organism viewed as integrated and interacting networks of genes, proteins, and biochemical reactions which give rise to life. So really maybe the best way to understand systems biology is in comparison to traditional biology. In traditional biology, you take a reductionist view and you focus in on a single entity, such as a gene or a protein, and you try to learn more about it, what its functions are, what it does, how it affects the system, how it affects the organism. Um, but in systems biology, we're looking to see all the parts together, not just what does one entity do, but how do two proteins interacting together change the phenotype of an organism. So in systems biology, we're interested in the emergent properties of the system. In other words, the properties that result as an interaction between uh, parts of the system. Systems biology has some pretty grand dreams. Uh, it generally focuses in on two areas. Uh, the first is genetically modified bacteria or organisms. Um, so maybe in the future, after we get a really good understanding of how to do systems biology and, and <coughs> manipulate organisms, we hope to be able to do something like create an organism that can produce clean energy or biorenewable chemicals. In fact, there's even a group here on campus, uh, the Center for Biorenewable Research, which is trying to do just that, trying to modify the E. coli organism in order to produce uh, chemicals from a simple molecule of glucose that can then be used in commercial products such as uh, lotions and plastics. Maybe someday we'll be able to create a bacteria that can clean up our waste for us, uh, garbage, toxic waste, or even clean up our greenhouse gas mess by sequestering CO2 inside the organism. Maybe someday. <laughs> Uh, probably because systems biology was conceived around the time of the Human Genome Project being completed, um, it's not surprising that medicine and medical applications are a large part of systems biology. Um, one of the most uh, aggressive ideas on what we can do to change our medicine and medical practices is called P4 medicine, or predictive, preventative, personalized, and participatory. The idea is that right now we treat people on a you're sick, let's figure out what's wrong with you basis. But we'd like to change it into a we can predict what will be wrong with you and fix it before it happens. Also, we would be able to personalize, for example, your drug regimen and participatory because you would know your own genome, you would know your own likelihood to be sick with certain diseases, and then you could then actively participate in preventing them. So in other words, what these two have in common is we'd like a very deep understanding of predictive biology. And we'd like to be able to do it enough that we could engineer biological entities to do what we need them to do. So some of the challenges of system biology, uh, as stated by the I Inter Inter Institute for Systems Biology, uh, we definitely have, have to advance our experimental uh, practices. Right now, Lots of omics data sets on which systems biology is based have large noise to signal ratios, ratios uh, and this complicates analyzing the data. We also suffer from a paradox of having both too much data and too little. At the same time that we have the ability to sequence an entire genome and understand all the parts of an organism, but we really need to focus down on one particular point, the rest of that data can become noise or extra work to sort through. But at the same time, if we try to combine data sets, having, we need to know if the data sets are based on the same organism under the same conditions, if the measurements can be compared together in a realistic way. Um, we also have some technical issues. Right now, we're able to perform many omics analysis to see the whole genome, proteome, metabolome, but in the doing so, we tend to destroy the cell that we're trying to study. So there's definitely a question of whether or not this is truly what's happening in vivo as opposed to what's happening after the cell's been destroyed. Uh, there are still computational challenges to take care of. Um, in order to 
move on to predictive biology, we need to be able to create predictive models, models where we can make a change and see what happens in the organism's phenotype due to that change. Uh, this is still very much an active area of research here. We also need to know how to integrate multiple data sets into a single model. It's great that we have the proteome in the genome, but how do we use that information together and see how they interact to produce the overall phenotype of the organism? And uh, the ISV also lists one more problem, and they call it the sociological problem. Because systems biology rests on the cusp between mathematics, biology, and computational science, and physics and others, trying to bring all these different scientists together to study one problem has its own challenges in scientific language and, and getting people to understand what each other do. One example of how a simple problem in uh, systems biology can turn out to be a really big headache. Uh, we have all these databases of information. Many of these databases even have the same kinds of information. For example, E. coli metabolic pathways. Maybe we want to pull this data together from the different databases and compare them, see if they have the same information or if one is missing parts that the other has. But even simple, something as simple as combining these data sets can be extremely hard for as simple of a reason as naming conventions. For example, we all know the molecule glucose but it can also be known as the glucose C, or 6P, glucose 6-phosphate, glucose 6, or the glucose 6-phosphate, the glucose 6P. Um, trying to combine molecules, or trying to match different entities between two databases when they don't have the same names can be quite a challenge. And you would think maybe you could just use the chemical properties, but even those don't always match. Um, the problem is actually that sometimes a certain database will use a generic name like glucose and ignore the stereochemistry. And so they aren't actually defining exactly the same chemical, even though it should be. Um, and also with all these extra synonyms for different molecules, sometimes two different things will have the same synonym or the same three-letter shorthand, like they like to use in models. This also complicates trying to match up data. So this is something that researchers are trying to address. Um, there are a couple databases that are doing this. MetReaction is actually using, I believe it was, eight biological da pathway databases and 44 metabolic uh, models. They're trying to bring all the data together and combine it so you can do comparative analysis between different models. EKM did the same thing, but they only used Brenda Kagan Medicine. How do we make biology predictive? Uh, another quote from the uh, ISB is that, in essence, systems biology aims to progress from descriptive, qualitative models to statistical or probabilistic models that can be used to simulate responses to perturbations of a system's molecular network in a way that will yield quantitatively accurate predictions. So what they're really saying is we need to be able to put biology into a mathematical model if we ever want to be able to predict. So the term biomodeling, which is another one of these terms that's hard to define, perhaps just the modeling of biology. Um, but what we need to do is uh, create a general definition uh, of models using some mathematical computational framework to define this biological system, or biological system can be anything from a uh, metabolic network to a cell to a whole tissue, really on any scale. So I'd like to get into a bit of what is metabolic modeling and how do we do this? Um, so the question is, how do we convert our biological knowledge into a mathematical model? And what we tend, uh, one way of conceptualizing this is to perceive of metabolites as pools that can then be transformed into other metabolites through reactions. So A, B, C, D, those are metabolites, whereas R1, R2, R3, R4 are reactions. And then we can draw this out in a network diagram to show how you can transform one chemical through a pathway of reactions to another chemical. So starting from this conceptual idea of pools of metabolites and their conversions to other metabolites, we, we lead into two different frameworks. For those of you that have taken BC before, you're probably familiar with ODE models. So a kinetic base model um, uses, uh, at its simplest model, it's just michaelis menten uh, enzyme kinetics. And what this says is that we have a pool of enzymes and substrates before you get to the product, these enzymes and substrates combine into a single 
enzyme substrate complex. And then this complex has either the fate of going to an enzyme product or back to its original enzyme substrate. So we need three basic assumptions to make this model work. The steady state approximation says that at any given time, the enzyme substrate complex concentration remains constant. Uh, we also have to assume that the free ligand approximation, so the concentration of free substrate is very close to the total substrate in the system, um, both free and combined. And also that uh, rapid equilibrium, we have to assume that it's much more likely for this substrate to go back and forth between these two than to complete to the product. Once we have these three assumptions, we can derive a more familiar form of the Michaelis method kinetics, where the reaction velocity is equal to the Vmax times the um, concentration of substrate over Km plus concentration of substrate, um, where Vmax is the maximum possible velocity, and Km is equal to uh, K off plus K cad over K on in the previous equation. So this gives us a curve of um, enzyme velocity over, depending on substrate concentration, approaching Vmax as substrate concentration increases. So then we have to solve this system. And we do this by setting up a system of different ordinary differential equations. In this case, uh, every reaction can be defined by an ordinary differential equation. Actually, I should say the concentration of a metabolite is defined by an ordinary differential equation. Um, and you can basically see it as uh, the rate of change of a certain metabolite is equal to how much comes in minus how much goes out. Um, we set up one of these for every metabolite. We can then use uh, any ordinary differential equation solver, such as MATLAB, or Capesi, or uh, SVML ODE solver. And we can actually calculate <coughs> the metabolite concentrations at any time in the system. So this is very useful to be able to calculate these fluxes. Um, it allows us to understand how concentrations change over time, whether they go up or down, uh, if metabolites pool in a certain area, or if they drain out. It also lets us see feedback loops or other control structures that might occur in this metabolic network. However, these models are fairly hard to set up. They require many parameters, because uh, you need the enzyme kinetics for every reaction you'd like to include in the model. And these Parameters can be hard to find, um, estimating them across many of your uh, free variables. And even if you do have them, there's still some doubt about whether they were obtained in conditions that you are trying to simulate in your model. Um, there's another caveat with these uh, kinetic models is that you actually have to achieve steady state before you can run into the simulation. So you have to run it for a certain amount of time, um, verify that it's reached a steady state before you can do any simulations or the results don't matter or mean anything. Because of the, uh, the problem with parameters, these systems are practically very limited. A few hundred reactions is probably a, a good size model. Whereas there's thousands of reactions in some of the larger systems. So one way we can deal with this is by using a constraint-based model. A constraint-based model doesn't need any kinetic parameters. In fact, the only thing it needs is the stoichiometric stoichiometries of every reaction in the model you're trying to simulate. So using the assumption that the cells are in a steady state condition where the concentration of every metabolite remains the same over time. Not always the best assumption, but it works. Um, and that the, the, if you predict fluxes using this, the, the reaction rates, the fluxes, are kind of an average over a short time scale such that uh, the system reaches um, an equilibrium. The react relaxation time of the system is very short, shorter than the time frame that you're modeling. But the environmental and regulatory changes that might affect your assumptions are on a much larger time scale than you're modeling. So they can also be better. So this results in a system where we can assume the primary constraint is simply the production and consumption rates for metabolites to be balanced under the law of conservation. What this says is that every metabolite produced somewhere in the system must be consumed somewhere else, and any metabolite consumed must be produced somewhere else in the system. Now we can add more constraints to this 
It's called a constraint-based model, after all. Um, so we, we usually uh, implement that law of conservation, the mass balance constraint, saying that um, S, which is a certain metabolite in the system, uh, some of that metabolite overall reaction flux, flux is a zero for every metabolite. So like I said, any metabolite consumed is, is produced and produced is consumed. There's no creation or disruption of matter. Uh, we also use enzyme capacity <clears throat> as a way to limit fluxes. If we know that a particular reaction doesn't occur in large fluxes, we can limit that uh, by forcing every reaction to be between some minimum and some maximum. Uh, we can also set thermodynamic constraints. So this is saying that we know certain reactions only occur in one direction and not both. <clears throat> and we can model this by saying that a certain reaction has to have a B min or a, maximum, a minimum flux of zero. That way it can't go backwards. Uh, we can also add regulatory constraints, which usually um, use some kind of a Boolean logic condition, such as if a regulator is active, then the gene won't be expressed, so shut off the reaction that enzyme catalyzes. Um, I also included here objective function, which is not really a constraint, but it's very important to many of the things you like to do with these models. An objective function um, specifies a certain reaction that you'd like to ma uh, maximize in the system. Um, it's written as maximize the objective function over the all fluxes in the system. So you would say, usually what you do is for an objective function is, is biomass, if you're doing like a meta metabolite growth. Um, so you specify a biomass equation, which is all the uh, metabolic entities needed to produce mass in the system. So these are drained out of the system in a single equation, single reaction. Um, and every unit of flux that goes into biomass is a unit of growth. Um, so by including that system, you can then do things like growth or no growth analysis, or try to predict how much growth you'll get under certain conditions. So I say solving the system for flux balance analysis because um, it's a little different. You have to interpret it differently than solutions for kinetic uh, systems. So what we do to solve this system then using flux balance analysis, for example, is we can convert all of these reactions into linear equations, such as A a equals B, A equals C, or 2B equals C plus F, right here. Um, this simple a set of linear equations can then be solved using a linear programming solver. Um, and what this will do is, and the reason why I say solving in parentheses in quotes is because you get one possible solution. Uh, these models actually give you uh, a whole solution space. They, don't, uh, they aren't well suited to predicting the intracellular fluxes because they, uh, the hallmark of constraint-based models is that they predict the whole solution space. Um, what this means is that many, many, many different combinations of flux could produce the same result. And to call it a weakness is kind of unfair. I find it uh, frustrating sometimes when I try to predict intracellular fluxes and I can't. But um, it is useful because it uh, correlates to the idea of silent phenotypes and that an organism can achieve the same phenotype in multiple different ways. And that's modeled by the fact that there's a solution space, a range of fluxes that can achieve the same result. Um, some of the strengths of this is that it simply doesn't require kinetic parameters. It makes it much easier to create one of these models in large scale. Um, and they can be used in different ways, uh, such as to infer network and topology properties. Um, they're particularly well suited to growth rate simulations. Um, one way that these models are refined, it's actually an iterative process, is to grow, say, uh, an E. coli bacterium on a certain uh, set of, of media conditions. And if your model can predict growth under those conditions, then, it, then they uh, match up. That's a good thing. If it doesn't, then you know you're probably missing something in your model. In your model. Um, and it works both ways. If your model predicts that deleting a certain gene kills your organism, then you can go out and do some gene deletion studies and have a better chance of hitting ones that are actually essential to that organism. Um, one of the interesting and newer ways that this has been used is in the OptForce algorithm. 
these flux balance models. Uh, so this is an algorithm for metabolic engineering. It's designed to help you create a strain that produces a certain metabolite in uh, exaggerated quantities. Um, what it does is it, it starts out by um, taking as input measured experimental fluxes. So you actually have to do uh, radioisotope labeling with carbon-13 to determine a certain small set of fluxes, such as maybe in the central carbon metabolism of your organism. Uh, you can feed this into the model along with into the optiforce along with the model, and it will then compare the range of fluxes that your initial measured model can achieve, and then it will compare that to some hypothetical model that produces the metabolite that you're interested in in large quantities. So you can say, specify, I want an organism that grows at least 10% of its original growth, but it produces 10 times more of the metabolite I'm interested in. And then this will find what minimum requirements you have to do to change that organism into your, your original organism into that hypothetical high producer. It's actually a very neat application. Um, some other frameworks do exist, although kinetic and constraint-based models are by far the most common that I'm familiar with. Um, but some of the newer frameworks are, are beginning to look the way into systems biology. One such framework is discrete dynamical systems. Um, so what this does is, it's, uh, at least um, in one example that you can use this for, you can use a discrete dynamical system to model uh, regulatory networks along with the simulation of the organism. So then you would take just the regular kinetic ODE equations for that model, for that system, uh, just as you would uh, predict the metabolic concentrations over certain time steps. But now you can add on top of this uh, a discrete or it's regulatory, usually it's Boolean on or off network, um, which will predict the enzyme states on or off and whether or not that uh, reaction can proceed in the system. So this is a dynamic way of doing what people had been doing before a priori, before they actually ran the simulation and determined which metabolites were on or off, or which reactions were on or off. So, and I feel one of the more interesting ways that modeling is being used and, and something that's necessary to truly achieve the goals of systems biology comes from whole cell modeling efforts. So, a quote from Masara Tamita, uh, the cell is never conquered until the total behavior is understood, and the total behavior of a cell is never understood until it's modeled and simulated. So what he's getting at is just knowing the genome, proteome, and metabolome of an organism is not enough to fully understand the phenotypic behavior properties of that organism. But to fully understand it, we need to be able to show in a computational model that we can actually predict the phenotypes that we think should happen. One of the first examples of this was actually done in 1996 uh, by the eCell project. Um, they called it the virtual self-surviving cell, and it was based on the genome of the organism Mycoplasma genitalium, which is a very simple organism. And they used it to determine uh, a minimum set, which turned out to be 127 genes and 40, 495 reaction rules. A minimum set of genes and reactions that would allow an organism to self-sustain. Not do anything else, not grow and divide, just stay alive. <laughs> Very minimal. Um, they obtained the uh, kinetic parameters from the literature and modeled it with a kinetic model. And the simulation, surprisingly, led to a very unlikely discovery during glucose starvation tests. And it's kind of a funny story. What they noticed was, right as glucose was about to run out in the simulation, they would see a spike in ATP. They couldn't figure it out. They weren't sure why the spike in ATP was happening after glucose was gone. So they spent months trying to go through their model, go through their code, see what they did wrong, and finally came to the realization that it was a very simple explanation. <clears throat> what happens is, in glucose degradation, you produce two ATP model molecules per molecule of glucose. But if you look at it more closely, you actually consume two ATP mo molecules first and then produce four later. So what they were seeing was the time lapse, the time delay between when the last glucose was used up and that last bit of ATP was consumed in order to produce more ATP. They would see a spike after that drain was removed and the last bit of glucose was transformed into ATP. So. Very simple discovery, but it shows why simulation is important. If we don't simulate these, then we don't really 
see these effects. Another very interesting project is the Virtual Leaf Project. Uh, so this project is uh, designed in order to understand the mechanisms of plant growth and development. And to understand just not just the cells at the molecular level, but at the interaction level as well. So the Virtual Leaf Project provides uh, a cell-based modeling framework uh, to make in silico simulations accessible to researchers. So they're it's written in C++. It's designed to be modular and to make sense on a biological level. They have object called, objects called cell walls and, and membranes and, and stuff that biologists would understand. <clears throat> and so the idea behind this is that it, it uses uh, actual geometric models. So it simulates the cell uh, in a spatial plane. And it, it simulates growth uh, using a Monte Carlo energy minimization. So cells can grow to a certain size based on the elasticity of their walls um, and then they have to divide or stop growing. And also um, one thing that makes this different from previous models is that cells, or plant cells in particular, uh, have a, a type of growth called symplasty where um, cells that grow next to each other, the cell walls, don't slide across each other like they would in an animal cell. So that was also modeled into this. And uh, I actually have a couple uh, videos to show of, of their simulations. So in this simulation, what they have is a single cell with uh, a morphogen being produced right here. Um, now, this morphogen is diffusing into nearby cells at a certain rate based on their, their kinetic model. Cells nearby that have a certain high concentration of this morphogen grow and divide. When that concentration uh, diffuses away and lowers down, they just begin to grow but no longer divide. And when that concentration reaches a lower threshold, they stop growing altogether. So even though this isn't actually modeling anything specific, it's actually very similar to root tip growth. Uh, so you can kind of look at it that way. And it's interesting if you watch it in a little bit. Oh, one other point to make. Uh, there is just one source of this mutagen. And when the cell that is producing it grows too large and divides, it's split into a daughter cell, which keeps it on the edge. But as you notice here, it's actually curving, which is very interesting, because um, they didn't model in anything like that. That wasn't part of their, their uh, intention, but some of these cells here started to see a, a lower concentration of this morphogen, so they stopped growing and dividing, and, and these ones kept growing and dividing and kind of curved it back around. So it's interesting to see what you can find just modeling these ideas. So I do have one more video for you. So this one's a little bit different. Um, this is modeling auxin-based growth in a plant cell. And it's going to complete before I can really describe it, but <laughs> play that once more. <clears throat> so what happens is uh, auxin is concentrated at the green part in the center, uh, which it both drives growth and, and the polarization of the cells. You can see, probably can't see the little arrows, um, which way a cell is pointed. But, So uh, the auxin centers form along the perimeter of the tissue and during certain, in certain cell concentrations inside. And uh, they, they continuously form and grows. And this model for how auxin diffuses and concentrates is actually forming this bulbous mass of tissue, which was um, described by a different paper. So they can take models of what they think plant growth is doing and how diffusion or creation of certain uh, 
signaling molecule is, is changing the shape and see if it really does work. I find it very interesting. So I do just have a, a few more slides. I wanted to give a, a brief description of what the speaker, um, what his previous work has been. Uh, so one thing he's worked on before is iron metabolism models in humans. Uh, general map of these, uh, so they created in cell designer a general map of, of iron metabolism for most any cell, like things, things that would be included in any cell type. Uh, and then they went through and, and made duplicates of this model and, and refined it down to the specific tissue of, of certain cells that were known to be involved in iron metabolism. So it was just a, it started out as a network of 151 chemical species and 107 reactions before it was uh, expanded to tissue specific subnetworks. Um, and what they're finding is that uh, analysis of this network may, may help with treatment of iron related diseases and complications such as diabetes, heart disease, and anemia. Because if they could figure out how this is affecting those diseases, then they might be able to uh, counteract it. Uh, I guess it kind of goes into that P4 medicine I was talking about earlier. And another thing that he's interested in is uh, systems biology view of cancer. And so he talks about how uh, net network inference is used to generate top-down models for omics data. We take full genomes, you try to figure out what proteins might be in there from a sequence of an organism. So you try to infer it top down. Um, but mechanistic models are generated bottom up. So if a, a researcher is trying to make a model and they, they go into the literature and find one enzyme at a time and add it to the model, that's bottom up. So he's really interested in how we can bring these two approaches together. Um, and he goes on to describe how a multi scale mathematical model of cancer. Uh, um, which included uh, three different models. It was cell signaling network, uh, cell proliferation, and environmental conditions. And what this model showed is that in radiation therapy for cancer, uh, the radiation damages the cells of the cancer, damages the DNA of the cancer cells, causes them to go into apoptosis. Um, but if you cause, if you do, treatments are usually given on a 24-hour basis, and if you treat cancer on a 24-hour basis, eventually the cells uh, in the center go hypoxic, and they stop being affected by the radiology. And so the model uh, predicted, based on the cell cycle of 33 hours, that um, 24 hours was not the best uh, time to every 24 hours to give the doses of radiation. And they were actually able to predict a, a different way, which, at least in simulations, increases uh, apoptosis by a factor of 20, um, which would definitely increase the effectiveness of treating cancer, just by changing how often or when you give treatments. So, the challenges of human biology are large indeed. Um, looking at simple cells like the uh, E-cell project, which only had 127 react, uh, genes, but uh, if you look at HMDB, there's 8,558 compounds in the human body, 5,849 5, proteins, um, and 4,827 4, reactions. If you look at reactome, and even with PETA says there's 210 distinct cell types which would all need their own separate models. So it's definitely a large problem and system biology has a lot ahead of it to take care of. It. That is it. Any questions?